Hey everybody, this is Tom, and this week's character is Sir William Amaranth Nigelius for Nicholas. Uh, this character is a uh, Goliath, which is uh, essentially a, a giant. Um, this is the first of his race that I've drawn for uh, the R&D Fantasy uh, project, I guess you'd call it. Uh, the winner of the first uh, themed week for sort of uh, Goliaths and Giants and other sort of large characters, but uh, I've really enjoyed uh, doing the themed weeks. Um, and I'm going to definitely be doing some more, going to be revisiting dwarves and doing some new stuff like drow and, and whatever else. And if anybody has any suggestions for themes, definitely let me know uh, in the comments here or on Twitter. Uh, so um, I wanted to I wanted to spice it up. I wanted to do something, uh, I mean, different. Uh, there's definitely a noticeable uh, leaning towards humans and half elves and elves and things, and uh, that's great. Uh, but I, I really like doing some of the more out there stuff. So um, that's kind of the main reason I wanted to do giants. Plus, I I just find them really fascinating. I've always had a hard time with giants and kind of getting their anatomy working right in a way that felt satisfying. And I, I saw this as a good way to kind of finally put my foot down and like see how something works out. So uh, I've gotten quite a few comments about the wonky proportions uh, and I th I I mean I think it's just people just can't tell from just the one picture of him outside of any sort of scaled objects. Uh, they can't tell that he's a giant so that's why he's all wonky looking and, and weird and stuff. He's He's got a different sort of uh, uh, anatomical system going on so I went back to doing the standard, uh, the sort of standard approach that's emerged with the, uh, the loose posed sketch and then going in with the muscles and things like that. So uh, one thing I wanted to uh, do in this case was, um, you probably heard me go on a few rants about uh, the muscular physiques and how um, a very developed sort of bodybuilder-esque uh, kind of muscle muscular system is very um difficult to achieve and very specific uh and i've but I've, I've got one going on with this guy and the reason is to do with his uh just his character um it's something well, like where uh I mean, i'll go and i'll definitely go into all the details that i had um about him but a massive portion of his personality is based on um beauty and self-improvement and sort of you could call it narcissism um, and so his his life uh, seems to involve much preening and primping and in in the case of him I, I think um, because he, he does have a combative role uh, this physical development sort of just like like how Greeks would hang out and go to the gym all the time like every day and, and do that sort of stuff so he does live the lifestyle that would involve um, uh, daily exercise for not only just strength, but also just for the the appeal of it. Which was good. It's a nice, it's a, it's a perfect excuse for it, and it kind of lines in exactly with all my sort of reasoning behind why I don't usually draw it, just because it it's so deliberate uh, of a body type that people living difficult, rough lives of like adventures and explorers I don't think would have the time or the care to really get into uh, I guess body sculpting um, yeah so it, but it was good so he's already got a really um, like imposing frame like muscular and imagine being a giant uh, I think they would probably just be naturally more muscular it just feels right in the case of Goliath over like a humanoid um, but he is also very heavy. He's seven feet tall and about 300 pounds. No, he's seven foot. I don't remember what the conversion was. He told me in centimeters. Um, and uh, yeah, I still can't. Even yeah, even though I'm Canadian, um, we're supposed to do everything in metric, but we're, I'm still in one. I'm one of those transitional generations where we still use feet and inches. There's like this weird kind of uh, hodgepodge of metric and imperial that we use. Where yeah, I can. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, so he's about seven feet tall, a little over seven feet tall, and he's about 300 pounds, so he's got quite a lot of um, mass to him. Not, 
I think I probably drew him a little bit bigger, uh, quite a bit bigger than 300 pounds. I think I, the way that I drew him is probably, probably is closer to four, four or 500 pounds, but I felt the look was kind of worth it. And I, I also did sort of make the legs a bit skinnier just to not only try to direct his, um, uh, his proportion to just be a little taller, but also I needed to lose some of that weight somewhere. Um, so some of the the development stuff that I did just before drawing going into this was I, I filled a couple of pages with hominid skulls. I talk a lot about um, using like Neanderthals and different uh, extant human species and hominids and things as reference of sort of seeing the the range that human and human esque bodies can get and sort of how like especially like rib cages flaring and the angles of pelvises and the skulls in particular and like cheekbones and sag sagittal crests and keels and brows and things and I've always thought it'd be good to have uh, giants that had something a skull that was a bit more primitive but with human features sort of stretched over it uh, just to give them a, a look that you know they're humanish they'd probably have the same sort of expressions and emotions and and you could read or read their faces and talk to them and and uh, and everything, but it, there was still just a little something a little bit off, something a, much more like heavy featured and and sort of bestial and um, you know you could still find beauty in their faces uh, and like I mean they'd be really relatable, but there'd just be that sort of otherness to them, and I think that going into ancient past is sort of a, a good source of inspiration for that kind of stuff. Not all the time, but it's something I always like. I, I like having um, fantasy that sort of dips its toe into uh, like Ice Age mammals and pre prehistory and stuff like that as far as kind of like a just like reference material. Definitely not a requirement, but it's just kind of where I, I like to go with stuff. Um, so yeah, I did a couple of pages of hominid skull drawings. Just went on uh, the best, I still just, over the years, just the best stuff is on bone clones and, um, oh, what's the other one? Bone clones and Skulls Unlimited. They've got great, uh, great stuff, uh, great reference, like high, nice and high res sort of pictures of skulls and, and uh, things like that. And, and, and I think it's Skulls Unlimited. They actually have, uh, um, he, you can actually buy human bone, like actual, uh, like donated um, skulls from living people and uh, it's one thing to use Google image search to find reference and draw skulls and things but or even like medical drawings and everything but there's such a um, kind of a homogenization that happens uh, with with those and there's a th it's sort of a something that you should be woken up to is just the difference between like a diagram skull and a real skull. So if you go on, I think, pretty sure with Skulls Unlimited and, and you sort of see the range that even a skull can have. I think that's been part of one, of one of the problems I've got with my own art is all my skulls are very similar, um, but the range is, is, is pretty wild uh, between individuals, uh, like just of um, but even different racial groups, like if you draw people from different races, but you don't, you're not aware of how the, even the skull is different underneath, uh, you can spend as much time as you want on the superficial, like soup, like surface features. And there'll always be something a little off if you don't understand like the depth details and the proportions of different sort of features there. And, um, it's just great to actually draw photos of just real, uh, like human skulls and, and get comfortable with the range that you can take it, it one thing that happens with a lot of artists especially with um like 3d artists like like in a game studio is there if you if, especially if like when the model building is actually started uh mm -hmm. Every time you go and sort of look at it, everybody's like, you know, the eyes are a little bit too far apart. There's usually like the space of one eye between them and the nose seems a little long. And over the course of a few weeks or months, there's an erosion procedure that happens where everything kind of goes back to what people were, were taught from like a, like Andrew Loomis diagrams of human proportions. And 
the things that make us unique are the things that get lost in that. And that's, it's really good to kind of just have like that fundamental basis of like the range of where the features should, should kind of be in order to work. But if you're just so blindly following that as like a dogma, you're going to have a really hard time getting personality and uniqueness and I think merit into your characters it's it's like what i always mention is same facism it it can it can start there if you're having struck if you're struggling with that you can start there um like what i would if as like an exercise if i just had to make something up on the spot it would be um find photos of different individual human skulls and draw them and then um take what you know about uh or like get some good uh diagrams of the facial muscles and then map them onto, onto those skulls on a new layer or on like a sheet of transparent paper or something and just see um, taking the same muscles and and, and um, putting them over a different skull and just seeing what the results are like and all the, and, and the different looks that you can get and it can help just some, sometimes to just see that uh, and just to like sort of let your mind let go of that so um, anyway back to the to the piece um you, like uh with his face in the sketch and with the anatomy and stuff it does end up quite being quite a bit different um as uh like at the end i do a, a, a bit of a paint quite a bit of a paint over right near the end so he does look different now but um but even at this point i'm kind of going for that uh weird human look where his mouth is too big and his cheekbones are quite pronounced and really th- sort of thick well, not thick but like tall lips that, like with a really animated mouth I think it would be cool if they um I mean giants would if you actually had a giant uh in front of you they would be uh really remarkably strange I've had some tall friends before but the tallest was I think six seven uh and the tallest person I ever met was I think six ten and it it was startling it was uh it's it's sort of otherworldly um when I was in Texas once and I saw a guy who I think was over seven feet tall, maybe, but I didn't get too close to him but um if you another um you know, what I'm trying to get is just whenever people think of epicness or 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 fantasy everything's got to be so over the top like a giant that's passing through the clouds and there's atmospheric perspective or uh, like a whale that you could have a city in and there's play, definitely places for those sorts of stories those can be some of the best things in the world but even just a giant that is seven feet tall eight feet tall if you'd had a, an eight foot tall humanoid in front of you with broad shoulders uh, that would be absolutely terrifying. They would be incredibly strong, uh, and their voice would be... I don't even know if you could even hear their voice. I'd be curious to see if there's been any, like, uh, scientific stuff, like, uh, um, like, what's, wait, what's it called? The, uh, sulf... some sort of sulfide... or... S- hydrogen hydrogen sulfide or no some, some there's some sort of gas you can find so a long time ago in the jay leno there's a clip and it's definitely on youtube uh where they they inhale this gas and it basically what it's doing is it that scales to our throat in a different way and so it does the opposite of what helium does and it makes the voice deeper and i think that's what a giant's voice would be like um even if they're like not even too high i guess you know humans have been eaten Eight, like uh, I don't know how tall Wadlow was, but I don't remember. I think it was over eight feet. Anyway, um, yeah, I guess they, you'd be able to. Yeah, you could hear them fine. They, they just have deep voices. I don't remember what I was going for. Oh yeah. Um, but even like if you've ever stood beside a horse or a buffalo or a, or especially like a moose, they're they're not that big in your imagination. But when you actually stand up to up beside it, even a horse. Like, you look at a horse's leg when you're right beside it, it is just massive, and you can just feel the power in it, and it's just, it's crazy. So even just giants, like, I, I like, when I draw my own sort of giants, they're usually, I like picturing them being around nine feet, which is still, like, really massive, but but I'm sort of done with the idea of them being so, like, 
like 30 feet tall or whatever and it's just anyway that's just a bit of a, a rant and ramble um so part of this guy's uh um, story is that he's he, he him and his mother are the two the only two giants in a city of humans and dwarves uh, the humans live on the um, at least I hope I'm not remembering this from another place. I think this is this must be where I read from yeah so that the humans live on the surface and the dwarves live under the under the surface and I guess there's a few reasons for it but with him being okay I should just get into to who he is before I start talking about his costume. Um, so I'll go through this a bit here. He's a Goliath Bloodhunter. A Bloodhunter is a homebrew class made by Matthew Mercer uh, from the show Critical Role, R-O-L-E. Um, Nicholas went and ex sort of explained it to me, and he was he just told me to just think of it as a, as a, a paladin, essentially, um, for this case. Uh, and he was raised in the Temple of Soon. Um, let me find where this all starts again here. So the character evolved over time, whom his girlfriend made this guy. Okay, so Amaranth. Uh, so yeah, his, his full name is Sir William Amaranth Nigelius. Um, he doesn't have a, a Goliath name because he grew up in a city uh, where he was the only giant, aside from his mother. Um, so Amaranth is by no means a typical blood hunter or a typical Goliath. Uh, this is pretty much the anti-stereotypical kind of character. To be completely honest, we really wanted to use the blood hunter class, which is different and more fresh than the standard classes, and we kind of forced it into our character concept. Though in my honest opinion, we managed to build, uh, to blend it all well in the end. Um, you can think of him more of as, as a specialized paladin, if that helps. I'm attaching a Word document. Okay. Um, the backstory. Um, yeah, this actually, that reminds me, that is, is one of the sort of funny things is I, I was aching to draw a, um, actually that happened to me with, with dwarves a lot. Um, I have a themed week, uh, and the winner has a character that defies the stereotype of uh, the theme uh, being that I wanted to draw. So I had a, uh, I, I had sort of a direction I wanted to, to get into, like just like a subject matter and a style that I was hoping to get into with the Goliaths. But uh, this char the character is deliberately uh, counter to that and when I read that I left and I uh, said okay this is great then um, so I, I just went ahead with it I mean of course I did I have to um, but it just it was uh, it just sort of caught me off guard it was funny um, okay so it's not a typical okay he's not he's an anti-stereotypical kind of character um, Oh, wait, oh, I read that part again. Okay, so anyway, so some of the things that are important uh, in Amaranth's concept. He grew up in a city uh, of men and dwarves, him and his mother being the only two giant uh, Goliaths, therefore no typical Goliath name. Even though physically different, his mother's status and his natural talents meant he was not bullied or scoffed at. On the contrary, he was quite respected and valued uh, even among nobility. He grew up in the Temple of Soon, surrounded by her priestesses and paladins. Soon's teaching are deeply engraved into his personality. Beauty, love, pleasure are core ingredients here. He respects beauty, cherishes beauty, and sees all monsters as the opposite of what his deity stands for. Yeah, so he's 220 centimeters tall, 137 kilograms, 21 years old, uh, with Green gray eyes, golden hair, and lightly tanned skin. He is muscular and heavily built as a Goliath, but not rough looking like a typical Goliath barbarian. Instead, his skin is smooth and, and uh, taken care of, and the feminine touch of growing up uh, around uh, mostly women in a temple of love is obvious on him. Uh, his sexuality is not determined at this point, by the way. Uh, he smells, he always smells wonderful and has a personal collection of rare perfumes and colognes. Uh, which I didn't draw. I figured he would probably leave those at home. 
Uh, he believes that having scars is considered beautiful. At this stage in his life, his scars are relatively minor, but if you feel it would be more appropriate drawing a more grown-up version of him where his scars are more remarkable, that would be completely fine as well. He also likes to showcase his scars, therefore his armor is made so that parts of his flesh are visible where his most proud scars are. Uh, sword cut left side of an abdominal region. We're not sure on the exact armor style at this stage and we'll be open to anything you deem suitable, so I, I hope they're not mad with what I went with. His weapons are short swords. Um, his most prized and valuable possession is a golden mirror of Soon. Um, similar to the image attached, which is the symbol of Soon. It uh, doesn't have to look exactly like that. The key points are that it's a gold mirror on the back side. It's the face of a beautiful woman. Um, yeah, so that's the description of it. Um, I think, yeah, somewhere else in, the, in a different part where we talked about the, the arrangement of the city. Yeah, there's actually quite a, a large document here. I might I might turn to that in a bit if I can't think of anything. Um, okay, so about uh, his costume and everything. Um, or actually the pose. So the pose is... Um, well, the thing that I sort of picked up most from uh, this character was him sort of being... Um, sort of kept, like, living in a temple, sort of one of a kind in, in a place that is obsessed with beauty and, and probably propriety and a lot of social status stuff. And I, I don't doubt that he's probably like a well-meaning good guy, but I, I saw him as being someone that was a bit aloof and self assured and uh, I don't want to say like cocky or arrogant but you know a bit of a smugness um, like he's sort of like a stallion like he's like a, sort of a, he's been primped and and, uh, and and pumped and and everything so he's got I just wanted a bit of like a, a confident smug sort of stance almost like a like like a model I guess that's pretty easy comparison like a fashion like a runway model type um, no, I don't think they're bad people, but at least I hope I don't think it comes across that way. But um, yeah, so just confident, uh, contrapasto with the one hip up, one hip down, shoulders a little bit, a little bit off, um, and uh, and then 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 like looking down the nose, sort of like you know he. I mean he is tall. I mean all the things that he has on his figure is made for him and built to his scale. Uh, and even his weapons, which are short swords, are, um, in, in one part of the email, Nicholas explained how they are, you know, they're short for swords for him, you know, so everything is scaled up to him, so I wanted to have, um, some indication of his scale, even just slightly, and so I figured, for the most part, if you're going to be interacting with this guy, uh, well, you're not his mum, so you're not the giant around him, so he's going to be looking down at the camera. So I thought that would be a good way to to make some uh, some scale noticeable there. It might not have come through, but but at least it gave me an idea of how to draw them. Um, another thing I wanted to do with the anatomy was just that I, I should mention before I forget is just the uh, like um, his legs just being pretty straight. Nothing uh, nothing surprising there. <laughs> just. Mm, more column like than I normally do. I like to have a lot of bend and stuff to my legs and curvy bones and things, but in this case it's sort of like an elephant where it's like bigger and heavier. And if you did have a humanoid getting this tall, you really need to have um, some more straight limbs, kind of, or for at least legs anyway. Um, okay, so we're getting pretty far along into this costume stuff. So uh, things that came to mind immediately were just uh, like pastel colors, light things, sort of, um, I don't know what's the proper term, uh, it's, uh, this, for the silverware stuff. Uh, like, oh, I feel like, I once watched a documentary on English silverware, uh, which was my inspiration for the armor, um, but I can't, I can't remember what it was. but. Something very custom-made, something very ornate and flashy, and everything is there for 
uh, beauty or um, elegance or flashiness sake. Uh, just time, I figured, and even um, like, so something that would need to be polished, something that would be expensive, definitely like a one-off. I felt that would be pretty suitable for him. It is velvet lined, even the uh, the insides of his um, uh, the um, his short sword handles that sort of cover his hands. He's got a red velvet lining. Um, yeah, something just very decorative, flashy, uh, elegant, fashiony, um, and beautiful, which I thought was important for him. Um, even like his hair. Uh, I was originally thinking about doing something, uh, I guess a horse tail would have been a really good reference, but, um, something with a lot of, like, ringlets and big curls and something that looks like he kind of has to, like, put his hair in those curlers every night, but I, th I went with just the straight hair, um, just because I think hair at that scale on something that big would, uh, look a lot more, it would be a lot lighter because of just... It's, that's just how hair is if you have like, so if you're looking at him and he was human sized, his hair would actually be like a lot thinner, uh, to scale. So it does hang straight down, but I also pictured him just spending a lot of time sitting there, either combing his hair by himself or somebody like other people would be doing it for him. Um, sort of like a golden child sort of sitting there being groomed before bed. I remember... I don't remember what it was in, but it's probably in a few things where like somebody, some lady was, she she was in her nightgown and she was like an old tiny movie and she'd comb one side a hundred times, then the other a hundred times, or with a brush. She did that every night and it just sounded so horrible. But uh, with that in mind, I thought that, that would just be something that I, I just pictured him doing. So I gave him that, that hairstyle to, to work with it. So, um... And then, of course, through, from the description with the uh, the scars being visible, I felt I kind of wanted to push that a bit further and make it so that the body as well is 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 visible. Um, the scars are allowed to be uh, visible, but the scars then become more of just like decoration on the body rather than um, uh, well, it just sort of sort of see, to me it just sort of seemed a bit tough where. Like when, how often is he fighting without his armor? And if he is fighting without ar or with armor, then how is he getting scars? Um, so I thought just having something big and open. It's also goes. It, it was nice to go on with like the flashiness of. Um, it's sort of like the male equivalent of like the, uh, uh, like the the chainmail bikini kind of thing, where he, like he, he just the body is is there to be seen and it's. Uh, you know, practicality be damned. Like his his motto is just a, like, or his obsession is beauty and and himself and showing sh showing himself off. I mean, um, with soon uh, there's altars in the cities at street corners where it's a mirror for you to like check up on yourself and make sure you're looking good. Uh, so there is a narcissistic kind of quality to all of this. So yeah. Anyway, so. After all that, back to the leggings things. Uh, another part of all this was I thought it would be suitable. I wanted to include as much um, like lace and lighter, frillier sort of fabrics. And so with the legs, I, I thought um, of having something wrapped around his legs, sort of like, oh, let me get, I guess exactly like ballerina, uh, like ribbon shoes or the ballerina shoes. And they have the ribbons that go up in that sort of crisscross chain link fence sort of pattern. I thought that would be good for him. Um, but it also, I mean, the main reason I wanted it, I found it to be happy is that um, with him living in the dwarven city, the dwarven human city, with the dwarves living down below and the humans living higher up, is that down below on his figure, there's the angular um, sort of straight edge uh, pattern or design that is sort of more dwarf dwarf looking and that's where that design that's where that's why I, I i first went with that and then it became the the ribbons going up the legs like and with the and, uh, and yeah and yeah so a little bit of that dwarven sort of influence and then it just goes up and the, the ribbon gets thicker as it goes up and becomes sort of like pants and it, it's just meant to be sort of 
um, beautiful and fancy and kind of look a bit expensive and be delicate. But uh, so that's what he's got his leggings there for. I mean, I can we can get into that as we go. So um, yeah, always making this this one this with this one I actually was able to keep really restricted with the layers really well. I am still doing something where I duplicate it and save it out as a new version and then merge a bunch of layers just to save on space. I've been having some frustrating issues with Photoshop lately and I don't know exactly what's causing it, but there's times when it just seems to get really laggy. I think I've tracked down what the problem is, but I've still got to get it sorted out. But I have always really liked having um, files that worked quickly. Uh, and keeping the layers down low is something that I find important. But I do preserve them by, um, when I, when I merge a bunch down, I always make sure that it's on a brand new iteration, uh, so that I can always go back if I need them. And that came in handy when I did the Shinock character. I had to go back and get the, the sketch, which was a couple versions back. And so it, it was nice to have that sort of confirmed. So in the case of rendering out the torso, um, this is a good, uh, one thing that I, I always like doing is trying to make sure that muscles are flexing or squishing uh, how they, or at least how, as close to how they would as I can get. Um, it might have been able to, yeah, I could probably get pushed a little bit more here with like the wrinkling in the skin and the, the, the abs on the crunch side getting a little bit smaller, but the one thing that I do to help out with that slightly, at least I tried, is just um, with uh, darker, starker shadows on the crunched side and then lighter shadows on the stretched out side because as they're, of course, getting stretched out, they stick out less and they would then have less shadows on them. Um, just subtle stuff like that is really fun uh, to put in. Um, and then even just... Uh, a lot of the time doing like rendering out anatomy to me is one of the most frightening aspects or um, challenges just because of how many ridiculous amounts of little bits of detail there are on, on a figure even a face like if you're looking at a face in certain lighting and you think about trying to draw it it just seems like the more you look at it the more details show up and there's just an unlimited uh, an unlimited number of lumps and, and and bumps that keep showing up and uh, it's nice to just this is another case where I mean it's kind of obvious but it's just good to uh, start simple um, always general to complex just like I've said many times uh, just put the shadows where you know they have to be and then <laughs> and start light and there you and then just keep just keep moving forward and just and don't worry too much about it just put it where you think it's gonna go and then once you get to a point where you have it where you think it's going to go, you'll have something that you can look at and it becomes much easier to see where it needs help. It's that same old um, progress, not perfection kind of thing. So don't get don't let yourself get overwhelmed. Just keep moving forward. Uh, the mountain uh, always looks huge, but you just take little steps to get up the mountain and then it's not so bad. It'll take a while, but just little steps. There's one thing I definitely wanted to make sure that I did for this guy's anatomy, and I just I wanted to give him really tall pecs, uh, sort of like um, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's got the he's got a really distinct body for a bodybuilder. Uh, there's a lot of kind of sameness, and but because you know, they're all they're all sort of going for like an image, but um, Schwarzenegger has really tall. A really tall chest which is sort of a neat look and that comes up in different places I'm sure but uh, I always thought that was a neat look so I wanted to remember that on this guy um, it also kind of helps him look uh, stronger and less like just an, uh, an enlarged human you definitely want to play with proportions and things and um, like even even longer arms like I think I, I probably hate uh, Hum like com like giants that are just big humans, uh, like in uh, kind of like I guess the Harry Potter movies kind of did it, which was annoying. But I just don't like it because growing up and seeing like 
a lot of old low budget BBC kids shows and fairy tale stuff. It was so often the case that it was just a or like Sinbad and Jason and the Argonauts. It was always just a guy like painted blue or something and it just sort of wrecked it for me. It was just it just always looks so tacky. Um so I always love just putting in that that warped anatomy to make it feel much more like a creature. I've always just been obsessed with I guess creatures, I think. It's just probably my favorite part of fiction, I guess. Um but it seems like just so, such a wasted opportunity to just draw it like a guy. And plus if you did have giants um I mean humans get tall. They a lot of them get over 7 feet. Like this guy is technically only about 7 feet. I think he's 7 foot uh 7 foot 2ish. Um uh the humans can get that tall, but they're they seem kind of brittle uh, at that scale. Um, they're at least very specialized, like a lot of basketball players. They're strong and and fast, and some of them are pretty like agile and can like turn on a dime and stuff. But they they've definitely got a shelf life that sort of expires before like a like a standard human, like between five and six feet is sort of better for that sort of thing. And I think that a giant would be actually, you know, I neglected to look up the, 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 the um, what their life expectancy is the, for the Goliaths, but, um, I see them anat anatomically handling the scale a lot better. They'd be able to, um, like they'd be adventuring well into middle age, like a human would be able to, uh, they wouldn't have heart difficulties uh, later on or any sort of like legs that explode into multiple pieces as easily. Uh, and so uh, to me, that's justification enough to warp the anatomy. And, and having long arms is a great way to do that. It's such a... Pretty much every character, <laughs> every non-explicitly human or elf character, I think, looks great with long arms. You never want to go with arms that are too short for this... For these sorts of characters except maybe if you were doing like a some sort of stylized gnome or something perhaps um but i also think that long arms are suitable for a giant because of their like kind of pendulous nature i figured that having long arms would be much more beneficial for like counterbalance and being able to move and keep moving um and i'd imagine that the bigger and even like stability uh, you'd, you'd, having longer arms would give them a lower center of gravity, uh, and it would also be able to help them catch themselves a lot better. Uh, so I'd imagine, I mean, there's definitely like a, an upper limit, but having a character, uh, like the bigger the giants, the longer the arm, I think would be pretty feasible. I'm a little bit skeptical about, like, how big the feet would get. I think probably the bigger they get, the stubbier their feet would get. Uh, but that's just a guess. I've got a couple people I could probably ask. To see what their closer to professional opinion uh, would be on that. But but that, that'd be something I, I'd probably include if I were to do a, a giant that was quite a lot taller. So one thing I'm definitely a, a big advocate of, and this is a good example, is just a limited color palette. I do have quite a lot of colors going for this guy, but even the hair, I think at its maximum, I was doing it with uh, three colors. And that's, for the most part, you can render any material uh, with um, yeah, three or four colors and get it like really like realistic and, and uh, translating really well. But uh, um, you should always try to use as few colors as you can. It always, things, always look better whether it's a just a character a creature or uh like an environment scene just having a more controlled palette is definitely something about it just makes it work better um i mentioned it before but uh, there's a there's one um time when i i mean years ago my roommates and i got a i don't know where but we had some sidewalk chalk we were just spending the evenings doing sidewalk stuff outside and 
everything just looked so nice. Like even um, none of my my friend, only one of my friends that we were doing it with was was an artist. But like even the stuff that he did, just having five or six colors just to fill up a tr uh, like filling up all these illustrations, it just worked so well. And I feel that if I had more colors, and any time that I've had like unlimited colors, things just kind of fall apart and get too busy and, and hard to see things and garish and tacky but starting off with as few thing if as few colors as you can is definitely recommended it's always better to add color when you need it um that's actually pretty good uh i'd say that's a pretty good way to just think about it or just only add a color when you need it when you're gonna need it um worst but most accurate answer is probably it's up to you um usually i'd say when you have uh, dif when you think somebody would have difficulty um just telling things apart on your character that'd probably be good or just if you need the attention drawn somewhere if there's something important or critical um have a color change up there if you need one um even just material change or the actual uh, shape of something can change and it'll sort of have the same effect because of how it'll affect the light and, and, and everything. But, but yeah, um, if you don't believe me, try it out um, or uh, Google people, just Google people that agree with me um, <laughs> and they'll tell you that I'm right uh, if you can find them. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, I, I highly recommend it. Even like look up, uh, um, uh, like Bruegel's the the um, the painter from a long time ago. I, I can't remember if it was, I think it was fifteen hundreds. Bruegel's or like the uh, the Triumph of Death. There are these two guys in there. There's this massive scene, and there's so many characters going and doing things, and and each one is really broken down to like at most three colors for the most part and it's uh one of my one of my favorite paintings it's creepy and spooky but um there's two guys in there fighting <coughs> excuse me uh and they like one is blue and one is red and it's it'd just be the perfect the perfect guys for a video game the perfect like player characters it makes me jealous every time uh but yeah, so that, that that's just a bit of advice there. Um, yeah, even the uh, in this character design, um, he's got sort of a I guess a skirt, uh, like a kilt or a tutu kind of thing. It was another way to kind of to go uh, a little bit more what we would interpret as being a fet, but I thought it also worked well with like Greek kind of toga. Uh, outfits or you see like messengers from the from like ancient times and they always had the shorter togas and uh, that were like above the knee length sort of thing and but it also worked with like the the leggings and the ballerina look and just sort of that uh asexual or i guess in this case it's not I think as asexual is like sort of sexually neutral and inactive and yeah so it, i guess is it drag drag is the word maybe yeah, you know, where he's like, you know, like the, like the gender of, or, or whatever. It's all sort of mixed together on, on this guy's outfit. and He's sort of going for something, sort of a look. Or just beauty in whatever sort of form. It, it doesn't matter whether it's male or female beauty. I think that he would have, especially if you're, if you're dealing with a deity that's talking about beauty and all this stuff. Uh, they'd probably not just have humans in mind, and if they had hum any sort of human in mind, it probably wouldn't be a specific type of human. So I felt it was sort of a mix, a, a great, like a great way to just sort of show what this guy was about was just to throw in male features, female features, and just sort of see what I could do with those. So with painting all this skin, I thought it would be important and worthwhile to uh, do what I could to include some subsurface scattering. I don't remember what layer mode I have it set to. The layer is labeled SSS. I think it's col uh, color or uh, vivid light. 
and I have it just set up as a clipping mask and you can set a layer to clipping mask by right clicking on it and clicking create clipping mask or when you create the layer you can check the little checkbox that pops up and do it that way um, and by doing that it just makes it so that it affects any pixel on the layer beneath it that isn't uh, transparent or has any if it has any sort of uh, um, I guess matter or information to it it'll affect it so um, in the case of this guy, I just wanted to add the subsurface scattering to the shadows, which is where it's most visible. You don't need to worry about it too much on parts of the skin that are reflecting light directly, uh, but in the shadow is where it gets, uh, that's that's where you see it most. Um, like if, as if you wanna like try it out, hold up a light or maybe a, or like a shadow when you're outside and you'll see between the shadow, you'll you want a hard, a sort of a hard shadow if you can get it. Um, you don't want to. It probably won't. It won't do it on a cloudy day, but on the border between your the the area of your skin that has light on it and in shadow, uh, there there will be a reddening, and that's from the light going into your skin and bouncing around, and then bouncing off all your blood and just shooting out, and it's got a tint to it from the blood. So that that's what that's going on about. Um, it can be an effect that gets overdone, um, and it takes some figuring out and what, just go with kind of how you think it's working out. Um, you'll get a feel for it and you can push it and you can, there's a lot of play you can do with it, but you can, it can really start looking just like a silicon model or like a, like a vinyl toy if you go too far and that's fine if you're going for that. Um, but being able to learn how to wield it and control it is, is something that is worth getting into. Because um, even things that are more than just skin, like a lot of plastics and like paper and stuff and uh, different materials will will also have subsurface scattering and, and it's important to... Or vegetation it gets it quite a lot, like cactuses and succulents and, and leaves and stuff. Um, it's kind of like if you look at the underside of a leaf that has sunlight on the other side, it's sort of that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, definitely worth uh, playing around with and getting into. Subsurface scattering, if you're curious. So he's got these short swords. A couple details about them. Um, I wanted something curvy and flowy. I thought that would be more uh, beautiful and status symboly than just a straight dagger or straight sort of sword, which. Short swords tended to be more, definitely more straight than this. Um, but aside from that, I wanted it to be, I wanted his hands to be covered because even though he's not ashamed of his scars, he probably likes not having his hands get mauled. Um, he, it might sound tacky, but maybe he doesn't want to break a nail. Uh, so just having his hands more enclosed I mean, he definitely could have pushed that further, but I didn't want to go too far. Um, and then they're velvet lined, and even even the handle is velvet. Uh, just it's uh, like the just to hint at like the sensuality of his uh, belief system, I suppose, or his obsession or or life goal. Very polished metal. <clears throat> I pictured him when he's like sun tanning, getting his hair combed, and he could be polishing his weapons, or someone would be polishing them while he was getting polished. And then for the, to make it a bit more ornate, I mean, decorate, highly, so highly polished, highly decorated, just to sort of fit in his armor. He'd be another character where I think the armor would all be sort of made at the same, like by the same person, um, and they'd be like custom, so it all, it would all tie together and it would look good. It wouldn't just be randomly, uh, random status objects that he found on the quest but uh so decoration and filigree on the blades but also i went in and added kind of a damascus steel kind of effect to the blade just to make it seem to look a little they are they do have magic in them um and i do like to avoid um things that are just glowing all the time uh but i want it just i like just little fancy details like damascus steel which is sort of like that um, swirly uh, effect you'll see sometimes if you look up swords. Um, I didn't go for it 
like I didn't want to make it look exactly like it. I just wanted to hint at the look because it. I mean, it's not Damascus steel. It's it's something else. It might you know there might be an effect of the magic or something. But I thought having that extra bit of detail would be suitable for this guy. And just spending time trying to make it look like it's the same metal. This one was a time where I had the right color, but I just didn't have the right tone for a while, and that's why it hadn't been matching with the armor. It was scary. So yeah, even the stuff on his outfit, it's stuff, it's stuff that's inspired by, like, like, teapots and, like, dinnerware from, like, 17th and 18th century English silverware. Um... But it seemed perfectly suitable for things that are just like flowery and organic and flowing and and decorative. And even he's got this sort of like a porcelain brooch in the middle of his chest. And it has a nothing too important, but just a little tree with some birds and a, and a lady on, on it. And I thought just having that would be a nice little extra bit of uh, like sort of fanciness and decoration. Where it's almost like he's for show. And I don't know if that's, like, him taunting someone or if it's just a way to show that he's, like, really into this whole beauty thing. But um, ornamentation, I think, would be uh, a pretty big deal for this guy. Yeah, I felt his face was coming off as just a bit weird and unnatural. So I just went in and simplified a lot of the planes. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's really dry in here. Um, yeah, and just generalized a lot of the forms and just made it a little bit less over the top. Um, and yeah, so it was, it was kind of fun. I definitely wanted him to just have like that Nordic y, long blonde hair, straight hair look to him. Like, definitely sort of. Uh, effeminate but built over like a really masculine like high te high testosterone frame i thought i thought having that mixed with his effeminate outfit would be like a good suit for the character or like there's something more going on with him like he's not just like he's not a just a jock and he's not just uh like a model he's he, he's up. He's, he's got his own thing going on, and he's confident. That's the sort of thing that I wanted to go for with him. Is especially like it seems in the past, like I'd say, fifteen years. There's definitely been trends in fashion, but to me, it just seems like there's uh, there's been an overarching theme of you can wear whatever you want as long as you sell it. Like, if you just walk around with confidence, you can basically just wear whatever you want and be however you want. I think it's kind of just... It's one of the things that we got from hipsters with, like, all the... I mean, I've got my own sort of theories and stuff. I mean, it's not, like, a conspiracy or anything, but I think it stems a lot from, like, the thrift store culture where people are looking for this, this sort of thing that's, like, the right kind of tackiness. Uh, and it's like it's sort of it looks bad on purpose uh, and it, I think it still goes even though things are kind of coagulating a bit but, but yeah just wearing whatever you want as long as you just have confidence and I think that this is what that guy would be at he would just this is what he thinks is beautiful this is what he thinks is functional uh, and so he, that's what he's going to wear so yeah here's some of that sort of Damascus steel kind of look it, just, blob, just blobbing it in. It looks sort of a bit more like a topographical map, but um, just once I go in and soften it up a bit, it kind of it sells the look. Something is fancy and distinct, but not too not too different from his sort of motif there. I wanted to fantasy up these a bit more, add them a little bit more of a. Like a combat readiness to them, I guess you could say. So I put in these little metal studs. It's also having them be golden. It adds a bit more of like the wealth. Or like the, the status 
decoration beauty, I suppose. A neat thing too is this is I finished this one up on um, on uh, Easter Sunday, and it was kind of nice that it wound up being something that was a character that was Easter colors, like all these nice pastel colors with the yellow and the and the light blue and the pink. It was a perfect Easter character to draw with color scheme. And yeah, just some decorations and stitch stitching work. Embroidery, I think it's called. <clears throat> I added this edge work to the ribbons just for a couple of reasons. Is like one is that it's just just this weird thing where fabric in fantasy, if it doesn't have edge work done to it, it just looks wrong. Like if you just have a piece of fabric that just ends. It just feels too modern and out of place. It just looks like a t-shirt or something. Uh, and it also just added some nice color and it just makes it look a little bit more expensive and and and, and, and good. And So yeah, very superficial reasons for it, but that's fine, that stuff happens. Faces can be tricky, although I guess with every part of a character it can be really tricky because it feels a lot, like a lot of the time things will feel like you can always add more, and it's pretty much true. You can you can always work on something and work on something and work on something. There's always details you could make and corrections you could do and everything, but learning to just sort of get to that point of does it read clearly? Okay, let's move on is uh it's a good habit it helps out it helps you get things done faster um i think it's always it's sort of hard to work on one part to completion and then move on to the next part to completion and then work from there there's definitely like a an overall um gradual build up over a whole thing that takes place um i think that's how people naturally work but i recommend it the only problem is that when i'm working on something and i make these videos Especially on the short one, it gets so herky jerky and like scattery, and you can't even see what's going on. And, uh, it's kind of kind of sad that way, but um, but building up things to a, a passable level where you can just tell enough, and then moving on to the next part, uh, you can always come back and add more late detail later or remove some later. But don't get too fixated on working on something for too long. <clears throat> That's an important. Uh, it's going to be an important part of this if you're going to be doing this sort of stuff professionally. You just got to do something and move on and, and just get the idea across. If you need something polished up, uh, they'll ask for it. Just make it presentable. If they can tell what it is, uh, you've done your job. Now being able to tell what it is is actually like, it still takes a lot of work. Like you need to be able to tell what a material is, what the shape of it is and all that stuff. It's not, it's not a speed paint necessarily, but, uh, the speed will come with practice, so just keep keep working away at it. That's one thing I keep trying to do with these videos is try to find ways to um, not only speed up my pipeline, but um, speed up my own like technique and how how fast I work, how much time I put into something, um, forcing myself to do things quick more quickly, or or however and. I, I think it's always important to try to find out <clears throat> or to explore ways to accomplish things um, more quickly. And as somebody who just admires brush strokes and visible blobs and shapes and accomplishing uh, a lot with a little, um, that appeals to me. Um, I can't do the rendery stuff uh, still, like like a book cover kind of thing. I, I just I just can't get that. Or like Blizzard art. I just that's so far above me. I'm just a sketch guy, I guess. Um, but anyway, yeah, so that was Sir William Amaranth Nigelius for Nicholas. He was a joy to draw. I, I wanted to draw a stereotype, and I got the opposite of a stereotype, and I find that uh, to be uh, an awesome thing to have happen, uh, especially for a glass. So there will be more theme, work, more theme weeks. If you have anything, if you have any ideas, suggestions, questions, theme weeks, art-related stuff, 
Let me know on Twitter. Let me know on here in the comments. I love answering questions and reading comments and everything. So just always feel free to contact me. This is for the R&D Fantasy Free Weekly Character Art Lottery on Twitter at R&D Fantasy, held every Monday. Uh, fantasy characters, everything like that. Thanks for watching, guys. I hope it helped.